And thank you, and welcome back to the next session uh, on the PWSA USA's Medical and Scientific Conference. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Ravina, uh, uh, Amy Ravina. She is a triple boarded certified pediatrician. She's boarded in general pediatrics, pediatric pulmonary, and, sleep, and pediatric sleep medicine. Her research interests include home sleep apnea testing in children with Prader-Willi syndrome and in narcolepsy. Amy will be talking by recording on pulmonary issues in Prader-Willi syndrome uh, as she is in the process of giving birth to her new baby right now. Uh, Amy is a great physician and a great will be a terrific mother and we wish her the best. Please make sure that you fill out the surveys at the end of the talks. Uh, those are very important that we get that uh, feedback information from everybody. And now here's on to Amy. Good afternoon. I wanna thank you for giving me the time to speak to you about pulmonary complications in the Prader-Willi syndrome population. The title of my talk is Catching Your Breath with Prader-Willi Syndrome. I am a, an associate, associate professor of pediatrics at the Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Children's Hospital. Um, and I am part of the pulmonary section as well as sleep medicine. Here are my disclosures. I'm a principal investigator for a clinical trial with Harmony Biosciences. I am also a consultant for Trend Community, both of which I will not be talk, discussing any of the topics uh, that I'm working on today. The objectives for today are to review common respiratory related conditions that are associated with Prader-Willi syndrome. We'll review common diagnostic testing that's available to help identify the etiology of respiratory issues in Prader-Willi syndrome, and then discuss some of the challenges in treating pulmonary related conditions as they may be obvious. Um, however, it's very common um, that you probably have already encountered them yourselves um, or may in the future. afternoon. I want to thank you for giving me the time to speak to you about pulmonary complications in the Prader-Willi syndrome population. The title of my talk is Catching Your Breath with Prader-Willi Syndrome. I am a, an associate, associate professor of pediatrics at the Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Children's Hospital. Um, and I am part of the pulmonary section as well as sleep medicine. Here are my disclosures. I'm a principal investigator for a clinical trial with Harmony Biosciences. I am also a consultant for Trend Community, both of which I will not be talk discussing any of the topics uh, that I'm working on today. The objectives for today are to review common respiratory related conditions that are associated with Prader-Willi syndrome. We'll review common diagnostic testing that's available to help identify the etiology of respiratory issues in Prader-Willi syndrome, and then discuss some of the challenges in treating pulmonary related conditions as they may be obvious. Um, however, it's very common um, that you probably have already encountered them yourselves um, or may in the future. So as you know, Prader-Willi syndrome, they have a spectrum of symptoms and clinical findings. Um, and so as during infancy and during toddler time, you will see that there's hypothalamic dysfunction, there's appetite dysregulation, they might have feeding difficulties, they also may have craniofacial abnormalities that may or may not be obvious during newborn period, uh, but as they grow uh, into a toddler age, you might, it might be more noticeable to either you as a caregiver or even the practitioner taking care of the child. And then one finding that is pretty obvious um, during the neonatal period is generalized hypotonia or just generalized low tone. And so this is probably the most common problem for developing pulmonary issues. And so this I will be re relaying back to this several times uh, this afternoon. And then when we're talking about symptoms, because of all these clinical findings, uh, 
patients with Prader Willi syndrome can have daytime sleepiness, they could have cognitive dysfunction, behavioral problems. They have problems with motor development because of their tone. And as a result of all these issues, they also have this appetite dysregulation that leads to failure to thrive or just difficulty growing in general. And as a result, they also can have sleep issues, uh, mainly sleep disordered breathing, which means they're not really breathing as well as they should while sleeping. And this can be in the form of snoring, pauses in breathing, choking during sleep. And we'll delve into this much into deeper um, into the next few slides as well. But I think one thing that most folks may be aware or may not be on top of their list of think problems that they might encounter is chronic cough and respiratory infections. So I'll be discussing a little bit more about that as well. And so as the toddlers grow into school age uh, children and into adolescents, they still have hypothalamic dysfunction. They have appetite dysregulation, but now it's in the form of hyperphagia. Um, and developing food-seeking behaviors. And as a result of that, they have problems with obesity and they could still have craniofacial abnormalities from infancy or toddler age. And as a result, they could still have excessive daytime sleepiness, behavioral issues and learning problems, sleep problems start to develop at this time as well, if not earlier. Um, the problems with sleep disorder breathing are still present. And again, chronic cough and respiratory infections are now probably um, higher on the list as far as complications um, as a result of this. So there's three categories that I'd like to touch base on as far as respiratory problems in Prader-Willi syndrome. One is aspiration or choking. Two is abnormal pulmonary function testing. And then three, which is the bulk of this talk, um, sleep disordered breathing. I like to do it in a case by case basis so that you may be able to find one or two characteristics from each of the cases um, that your child uh, might have or you never thought of, um, but might be more vigilant at the end of this talk. Um, so hopefully this will be helpful to you. So case number one, we have a 14 month old male with Prader-Willi syndrome. He's had persistent respiratory infections that required antibiotics and oral steroids. He's always been a poor feeder. He's had two hospitalizations for acute respiratory failure, meaning he needed some form of oxygen um, or they were worried enough that they put him in a critical care um, unit, but he's never needed a breathing tube and he's never needed to be on a ventilator. He attends daycare, his vaccinations are up to date. On physical exam, you can see that there's uh, pronounced hypotonia or low tone. There might be some slight scoliosis that um, has been present on previous x-rays that you've noticed. Um, and there's also a slight pectus deformity or um, the sternum looks a little bit more um, inward um, indented, if you will, um, and not quite um, cosmetically pleasing. The chest x-ray shows right upper lobe infiltrate, suggestive of a pneumonia. And so this is the classic case or history of aspiration. Um, and so aspiration really means that there are secretions or food content or even liquids that instead of going down the esophagus, it actually goes into the pulmonary tree. Um, and so this can cause choking. Um, some folks may not be eating by mouth, but have a uh, tube in their stomach, also known as a G-tube. Um, and they could still be having aspiration issues because they have a lot of oral secretions um, and so or saliva. And so instead of swallowing them and it goes into the belly, it actually goes into the pulmonary tree. Um, and the problem with this it, in general is that with the Prater Willi kids, especially the infants, they're already weak in general. They have low tone, but their swallow coordination is not that great. Um, and so they're even at a higher risk for aspiration. And the other issue with this population is that things that may be very obvious to us as far as choking, coughing, gagging, um, when they're feeding or after they try to swallow might be more obvious for some folks, um, especially if you're taking care of them on a regular basis. Um, but for Prader-Willi syndrome kids, there it's not that obvious. Even if you're watching and you're trying to see 
um, look for signs of choking and gagging, you may miss that as well. And so it might be very small amounts that are going into the pulmonary tree and you may not even appreciate it until they actually are um, to the point where they're coughing more even outside of feeding um, and they look like they've developed a cold of some sort. The kids, as they get a little bit older, um, they are at a higher risk for aspiration and choking because of the hyperphagia. Um, they're eating all the time, so their swallow coordination is even more dysregulated. Um, and then if they're not chewing properly, now you have larger contents of food in the airway, um, plus a poor gag reflex. So um, there's nothing really to stop them from continuing to eat until it's too late. Um, and so there are documented studies that have demonstrated this in this population. Um, and so this group looked at choking as the main um, symptom of aspiration. And so what they found was out of 152 patients, there were 12 that passed away um, from choking. Um, the, what's not clear about this, this study is that did the choking happen because of the fact that they had an acute event and they were choking on the spot or and then had a sudden death um, uh, as a result, or did they have a choking episode, it led to a pneumonia and it was caught too late and then they died. So it's not clear. They, the study also looked at families answering a questionnaire and identifying whether or not the, there was a report of choking. And so 34% of the families that answer this questionnaire uh, responded with, yes, my child chokes, which is a pretty high number. So as far as pulmonary function testing in the general population, we typically like to test the volume um, that is delivered in a normal breath, as well as during specific time frames uh, during the respiratory cycle, whether it's inspiration or expiration. And we usually like to start this at the age of five because this is the time where they can follow commands and they can inhale and exhale upon command. The issue with Prader-Willi syndrome is very limited. There are some high functioning Prader-Willi kids that can perform spirometry or pulmonary function testing. And so for those kids, um, in which we're able to get that those findings, um, we see something called a restrictive impairment, um, which is a result of the muscle weakness or the low tone, as well as the obesity factor. And so what do I mean by restrictive impairment? So it's basically not being able to, for the lungs to expand to its fullest um, in simplest terms. And so if you have trunkal obesity or just a lot of, um, pressure from fat um, collection uh, sitting on the chest, the lungs are not going to expand as well as they should. The same thing with muscle weakness. If the muscles are not helping the, the chest wall to expand when the lungs expand, it also can cause a restrictive component. And so for the, the caregivers out there, here's what we find as far as spirometry results, um, a low FEV1, a low force vital capacity, we might see some residual volume um, elevation as well as a low normal total lung capacity. Um, the other thing that I wanted to highlight um, that not everyone does, but I think should be done is looking at the maximum inspiratory pressure as well as the maximum expiratory pressure. These are values that you also can get during pulmonary function testing, um, but most of the time they do it in the neuromuscular clinic or kids who have Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. I also think they should be doing it in Prader-Willi syndrome um, clinics as well. Um, and the reason for that is because we know that they have overall generalized low tone, they have muscle weakness. And so these, me these measurements can actually help you um, determine uh, whether or not it's progressive or if you're in a stable time frame as far as things getting worse. Um, so it's a way for us to trend these numbers and kind of identify whether or not we need to intervene sooner or later as far as um, treatment modalities. So going back again to the muscle weakness, we look at the expiratory or exhalatory um, respiratory muscle weakness. And the reason for that is because in order to cough, you need to have a poor, um, you need to have a good, strong muscles in the expiratory um, uh, phase 
so that you can actually mobilize the secretions or the mucus that's sitting in your chest. Um, but if you have a small tickle um, that you consider a cough, it may not do anything. And so asking whether or not your child has a strong cough or not is a very important question. Um, and so you want a nice hearty cough. Um, as on command. So if they can do that when you ask them to cough, then maybe they have a good cough reflex and we may not have as many problems with secretions. Um, but for those that just have a, that do a little bit of a <laughs> kind of thing, it's not going to do very much if you have a lot in your chest and you're trying to move those secretions out. If you don't move those secretions out of the chest, it then eventually becomes thick and viscous and then eventually a good night is for um, a pneumonia to, to develop. And so this is usually a problem, not when they're well, but when school starts for at the beginning of the year or during um, the winter's time when their upper respiratory infections are more prevalent, um, you have something that's in their upper airway and you just have like a head cold, but then it develops and progresses into the lower airways. The problem again is they may not respond the same way to a cold as some other typically developing children. And so as a result, the Prater Willys population is actually at an increased vulnerability um, because and can be associated with sudden death um, just because of the fact that they just don't act and, and behave the same way as someone who has uh, who is typically developing. So I mentioned muscle weakness, but I have to touch base on the fact that the, the brain is not really as normal either. So there's the hypothalamus is not functioning the way it should. The adrenal glands also um, are not functioning the way they should during the acute illness. So if they have a cold um, and they have um, some symptoms, but what ends up happening is they may have lack of fever um, and they may have poor stress response. And so as a result, you may, as a, if you have a typically developing child in your home, you may not be able to compare the two because of the fact that they're not going to develop fever like a child who has normal response to um, a cold versus someone who has Prader-Willi syndrome. So moving on to case number two, we have a four-year-old female who has confirmed Prader-Willi syndrome via genetics. She has snoring, she has witness apneas as the caregiver is watching um, her sleep, she notices that there's pauses in her breathing. She has daytime sleepiness, which is noticed by the teachers. The symptoms started about a year ago. She has some tonsils in the back of her throat. It's not that significant. Um, her body mass index is at the greater than the 95th percentile. She had a sleep study, also known as a polysomnogram, and that showed severe obstructive sleep apnea. So obstructive sleep apnea is part of a group of conditions um, that I like to call sleep-related breathing disorders. And so this term is based off of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. Um, and what they state is that obstructive sleep apnea is just one component of having problems during sleep. Um, you can have CO2 retention or carbon dioxide retention, which is sleep-related hypoventilation. You can have oxygen um, parameters that are low during sleep without any cause. Um, usually it's secondary to really bad lung disease. And then you can have central sleep apnea. Um, and we call it a syndrome because there's multiple reasons as to why you could have central sleep apnea. And so I like this Venn diagram because it's not one or the other. It's not just obstructive sleep apnea, but you can have a combination of obstructive sleep apnea, central sleep apnea, and hypoventilation, or a combination of all four. Um, and so these are all grouped as sleep-related breathing disorders. So when we talk about sleep disordered breathing, in particular obstructive sleep apnea, the symptoms can be pretty vague um, when you're talking about all of these conditions, but for the most part, you see snoring, pauses in breathing during sleep. You can have apneas, uh, also known as pauses in breathing during sleep, choking or gasping for air during sleep, restless sleep, and excessive daytime sleepiness. And so I know this slide is very busy, but for the practitioners out there, um, I thought this would be helpful. In order to diagnose obstructive sleep apnea, you need to have snoring, labored or paradoxical breathing, 
um, or some type of daytime impairment, whether it's sleepiness, hyperactivity, behavioral problems, or learning problems. And you must have at least one or more um, event, meaning an obstructive apnea, a mixed apnea, or apopnea per hour of sleep. Um, and this is the AHI that everyone looks at on the sleep study. So it should be greater than one. You could, if you have less than one, um, but you also have hypoventilation, then that also can count um, as obstructive sleep apnea um, as far as the definition goes. So sleep disordered breathing and PWS. So obstructive sleep apnea is very frequent in this population and it's due to a number of reasons. One is their overall anatomy and their higher risk because of the fact that they most of them have problems with weight. They all have some form of problems with tone. So usually it's low tone. Some folks have micronathia, which means the chin is slightly smaller than a typically developing child. They might have a small nose um, and the back of the throat might be also smaller than um, a typically developing child. And then their secretions, there are some theories out there that's, that believe that the secretions might be a little altered and they're more viscous. Um, I think we're gonna start to see more animal models out there that will support this. In a retrospective study of 88 patients, they found that the prevalence of sleep disordered breathing was 53% in children with PWS and 41% in adults. I'm sure this number is probably gonna change over the course um, now that there are some treatment modalities, but that's, pretty, that's still a pretty high number. In addition to the fact that patients with PWS are at risk for hypoventilation, meaning that they retain carbon dioxide when they're sleeping. And that's, again, secondary to the fact that they have low tone, their respiratory muscles are weak, they have obesity issues, um, but they also can have spinal abnormalities. So if you have scoliosis in addition to all of this, that can prevent the lungs from doing what it needs to do um, and get the oxygen into the heart, into the lungs, and out to the rest of the body. The other thing um, that's important to know is that many patients with Prader Willi syndrome have confirmed oh. obstructive sleep apnea on the um, sleep study, um, but they may not have obvious clinical symptoms. So there's a low threshold for evaluation, and we'll talk about when that could be um, in towards the end of this talk. Hmm. So case number three is a 14-year-old male with Prader Willi syndrome. They have snoring. They also have pauses in breathing during sleep. They had their tonsils and adenoids removed at the age of four. The body mass index is at the 75th percentile. And the sleep study, just like the previous child, shows severe obstructive sleep apnea, but this time also shows central sleep apnea. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about central sleep apnea because it is a, 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 an isolating factor in, in this population. And so the definition um, of central sleep apnea is that there's absence of inspiratory effort and at least one of the following. So the event lasts greater than or equal to 20 seconds, or there's a drop in oxygen saturation, or there's an arousal with it. Um, in the infants, there's something called bradycardia or low heart rate that can be associated with the event. But for the older kids outside of infancy, it's, it's usually one or two. Um, that fits this criteria. And so the reason for central sleep apnea in Prader-Willi syndrome is that there's peripheral chemosensitivity chemosensitiv um, that's not really present, meaning that they have abnormal control of how they're breathing. And it's because of the fact that we have these sensors in our body that are not present or not really working as well. And I'm going to delve into this a little bit more so that you have a better understanding of um, what actually is happening. And so there are two mechanisms. The first one is the hypoxic ventilatory response. And so this is mediated by chemoreceptors or just little uh, parts of the body that control um, how the body is supposed to respond to when oxygen is low. And so they're located in the carotid bodies, which is in the neck. Um, and this communicates with the respiratory control center in the brain. And basically it regulates how fast you're breathing. So your respiratory rate, 
and how much volume you're breathing, um, which is your tidal volume. So your tidal volume, when you're just sitting here, cool, calm, and collected, is the volume that is inhaled and exhaled when you're cool, calm, and collected. And so both of these will go up and down based on what the oxygen levels are in the body. Um, and so in patients with Prader-Willi syndrome, they either have a blunted response, meaning they don't react the way they're supposed to, or they have no response whatsoever when they're compared to healthy controls. And so the example that I give you is if you're at sea, if you're at um, high altitude out in Colorado, um, usually what you would expect is your respiratory rate to go up when you're at higher altitude. Um, but in Prader-Willi syndrome patients, they don't, that doesn't change their respiratory rate and their tidal volume are actually the same. And so they don't, there's no compensating mechanism there. The other thing that Prader-Willi syndrome patients have is a paradoxical response. So when they're breathing higher concentrations of oxygen, instead of increasing their, uh, or decreasing their ventilation, um, they're actually breathing normally or, um, higher than you would expect. And so for the practitioners out there um, know this very well, if you give someone who is breathing normally, who's typically developing oxygen, they eventually will stop breathing on you because the body senses that they don't need help regulating oxygen. And so the body stops breathing and that's normal. Um, so, but for the Prader-Willi population, if you do the same, so you give someone who has Prader-Willi syndrome oxygen, um, they don't have that same response. In fact, sometimes they actually feel better um, or they might actually not have the significant drops in oxygen saturations, but they continue to breathe. So they don't stop breathing like the typically developing patients do. The other mechanism, so that was oxygen, is now we're going to switch over to carbon dioxide. And so the fancy term is hypercapnia ventilatory response. Excuse me. And so this is the individual's response to elevated concentrations of carbon dioxide. So typically what happens is if your CO2 or your carbon dioxide is high, the body senses that. And basically you start to breathe a little bit faster so that way you can blow that CO2 out um, and maintain normal amounts in the blood. But for patients who are obese and have Prader-Willi syndrome, that response is blunted compared to those that are not obese but have Prader-Willi syndrome. Um, and so there's a big difference, there's a big difference in how, the, how this response occurs. Um, the reason of why it happens is not very clear. We know it has something to do with the brain and how it's um, regulated, but the clear exact mechanism is not clear. So when you look at how do we find out whether or not your child has Prader-Willi, um, not Prader-Willi syndrome, but uh, obstructive sleep apnea or central sleep apnea, well, the gold standard is a polysomnogram or a polysomnography. And so the difference between obstructive and central is that is airflow, basically. Um, so if air is moving through and then all of a sudden stops, but the chest wall is moving because the brain is get, giving the signals to breathe in and out, then that's an obstructive event. But if everything stops, airflow stops, and the chest wall is not moving, then that is a central apnea. And so remember, Prader-Willi patients can have both obstructive and central um, sleep apnea. And so here is what it typically looks like after your child gets hooked up with um, every, all the leads for a sleep study. Um, some of you are familiar with this and some may, you may not, but there are sensors from an EEG or brain um, are, are on the brain that helps with identifying whether you're awake or asleep. There are leads by the eyes that identify eye movements. There's a nasal sensor that can help identify carbon dioxide levels as well as um, whether or not air is flowing through the nose uh, the way it should. There's some um, leads on the chin, um, as well as on the chest and on the legs. Usually there's something called a pul pulse oximeter um, that measures the oxygen levels in your, in your blood. That's usually on the finger or on the toe, depending on the age of the patient. 
There's a single lead EKG, so it's not a full 12 lead, um, but it gives you an idea of whether or not the heart is having a normal rhythm or not. There is a microphone to detect snoring or any type of vocalization during the sleep study. There's also a video camera to see if there's any abnormal behaviors um, as far as um, what happens during sleep. And so we put all of those things together and we come up with whether or not there's a diagnosis of central sleep apnea or obstructive sleep apnea. So I was asked to mention a little bit about home sleep apnea testing. Um, at this time, per the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, the home sleep apnea test is not approved for children. And it's mainly because there's so little data that's out there. There are a few studies um, that show that the home sleep apnea test is feasible in children. So it might be something that we might see more and more um, in the hospital setting. Um, we are actually about to finish a study where we're looking at controlled settings, meaning we're setting up the machine uh, on your child and you go home and you sleep with it. But this is only in typically developing children. We have not yet moved on to um, specific populations like the Prater Willis population. However, the question that comes at hand is, if it is found to be feasible, could we use it in prater willi syndrome patients? And I think the answer is maybe, but probably not. And the reason for that is there's limited channels compared to the gold standard. So you're not gonna capture everything that you're looking for or worried about. It might underestimate the severity of sleep disorder breathing. So um, you can't compare a home sleep apnea test to the gold standard. Um, it needs to be apples to apples. I think the main concern though, is we know that carbon dioxide regulation is abnormal. Um, and so we don't measure CO2 levels on a home sleep apnea test. And so this might be missed and thus it's probably not gonna be something we see in the, in the near future. So now I'm gonna to shift towards treatment um, options of how we treat um, different um, sleep disorder breathing um, and first we'll start with pediatric obstructive sleep apnea. The mainstay usually for the school age kids because of the fact that obstructive sleep apnea is related to the tongue falling backwards, but also if you have a lot of tonsillar tissue, which is right in the back of the throat um, or big adenoids, which sit behind the nose, um, if you remove that, then that might actually help relieve some of the blockage and allow air to move freely throughout um, from the nose into the lungs. But some kids, they already have that done, but they still have issues. Um, and it's mainly not because of the tissue that's in the back of the throat, but now it's the neck size, the truncal obesity, um, and again, dysregulation from the brain, like in prater willi syndrome. And so we would have to revert to non-surgical options. And so this is in the form of positive airway pressure therapy. You can also have a combination of positive airway pressure and surgery. You can work on weight management strategies. There are some adjunctive therapies that are available, um, but they're only for mild obstructive sleep apnea. So you could use like uh, Montelukast and a nasal steroid combination. Uh, but again, it's only for mild obstructive sleep apnea. The studies have not shown benefit in moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea. Surgical interventions as far as helping with craniofacial abnormalities. So if your mandible or your maxilla, which is the top of your jaw, um, is abnormal, could they potentially help in, uh, expand it so that way your tongue doesn't fall backwards? Um, this is not as very common in the prater willi syndrome population unless you have significant craniofacial abnormalities. Positional therapy is hard to do, especially in young children. Um, but basically, if you have someone who has worse breathing issues when they're on their back as opposed to their side, then you would um, recommend having them sleep on their side. There's also different um, gadgets that you could use and have them wear while sleeping. But again, difficult in this population. For those who have mild obstructive sleep apnea, you could also do something called watchful waiting. Um, for those who are familiar with the CHAT study, um, this is just a way to reevaluate symptoms after six months um, to see if, if their symptoms have improved. Um, but again, this is mostly for the mild obstructive sleep apnea group. Once you're at the moderate to severe um, severity, it's, it's 
unlikely that it's going to improve. For central sleep apnea, the treatment is non-invasive ventilation. So basically it's the form of CPAP or BiPAP um, with a backup rate. And so I'll show you what those look like in a little bit. Um, there is something called ASV, um, adaptive servo ventilation. This is not approved in children. This is typically seen in adult heart failure patients, although we may use this in our older Prader-Willi syndrome kids who have really bad um, heart failure secondary to the fact that they have really bad lung disease. Um, but again, this is not something very common. The most common ones are CPAP and BiPAP. For the younger kids, if you have significant sleep apnea, whether it's central or obstructive, um, supplemental oxygen can be useful, um, especially if there's no nasal interface or mask that's going to be safe for the home environment, um, because a lot of these masks are made for adults. Um, but it's also good for the Prader-Willi syndrome population if you're an infant, um, because remember, the respiratory drive or the, the drive to breathe is not blunted if you're given oxygen. Um, versus someone who doesn't have Prader-Willi syndrome, if you're giving them oxygen, um, you have that risk of having a apneic episode because of the fact that the body senses that there's no need for um, the body to breathe because there's enough oxygen in the blood. So I mentioned positive airway pressure therapy. It can be in the form of CPAP, BiPAP, or bi-level positive airway pressure. If you add a backup rate, then they call it the ST mode. Um, we're starting to see and use uh, APAP, which is auto positive airway pressure therapy also. Um, this is kind of um, a convenience for, especially during COVID times, um, when you can't bring a patient back to the lab to figure out what the best pressure setting is for a CPAP and BiPAP, then you can use auto PAP, which basically is a range. So you guess a range for the patient, and then you bring them back and see if it, if their symptoms get better and um, kind of see where their most of the setting requirements are when they're sleeping. Um, a lot of folks don't like APAP because of the fact that the pressures change. It only delivers pressure when you need it. It's based off of the vibration of the interface or the mask. Um, so it may not be as comfortable as CPAP and BiPAP, um, but it is a good alternative if you have limited access to care. So the other thing that to think about is that when you give airway pressure through a mask, this also helps with reducing um, upper airway obstruction, meaning the tongue from falling back. If there's a lot of tissue in the back of the throat, then this actually pushes them out of the way um, and it reduces sleep fragmentation and it helps with um, taking a nice deep breath while sleeping. So it might help with sleep issues as well. So when we talk about CPAP, BiPAP, AutoPAP, they all need some type of mask um, that is connected to a device. And so we call that interfaces. They come in all shapes and sizes. Most of them are made for adults. Most are not approved for children. However, we do use them off-label. Um, and they can be a nasal mask versus a full face mask, which I'm going to talk to you, I'll discuss further in the next slide. Um, the key, though, is when you try to figure out what is the best pressure setting um, for the patient, it's also what is the best mask also. So it's two things. Um, it's not just pressure or it's not just the mask. It's a combination. Both have to be perfect in order to be successful in um, wearing those CPAP and BiPAP. So you can have multiple types of interfaces. One is the nasal mask that just covers the nose. You can have something called nasal pillows, which doesn't really cover the bridge of the nose, but it seals at the nares or the base of the nose, um, but it doesn't cover it. Then you can have the full face mask, which basically covers the mouth and nose. I'm not a fan of the full face mask, mainly because I have not seen um, very many pediatric uh, made ones. Um, and a lot of them are so big and so bulky that they can actually cause air to leak into the eyes of, the, of patients and cause some eye damage. And so the other issue with using a full face mask is patients who have problems with aspiration or at, or at risk, um, they may not be able to pull off the mask in time if they 
have so much air being blown into them. And then all of a sudden their belly just feels so full and they have to vomit and then they're not fast enough to rip off the mask. They might actually get some of that vomit into their airway. And then that also can cause some irritation in the lung and develop a pneumonia that way as well. And so you can see at the bottom right corner here, this is a full face mask. It covers the nose, the mouth, but you can see how bulky this is. And so if you have a, someone who's very sensitive to, to things on their face, who's not really used to it, um, this may not be the best mask for them. Um, so we try to stick to either nasal pillows or a nasal mask. So despite me telling you that the right pressure and the right interface are the key to um, successfully wearing this treatment, why is it still challenging in the PWS population? And there's so many reasons. One is you can have self-injurious behavior as a result. So they might have um, a lot of backlashing from the fact that this is something new to them and they're not familiar with. They might be scared. Sometimes when you're having a sleep study and you're trying to figure out what the right pressure is, the leads pop off a lot. And so they, they're somewhat traumatized from that experience. If you're wearing the BiPAP or CPAP for a very long period of time, for several years, you can have skin breakdown. Sometimes it's just the fact that they're delayed and they don't understand what's going on so that it, it contributes to the fear and anxiety, which they already have. And also because we have limited research in children. Um, we don't have all what's out there in the adult population to compare um, to this population. And so it makes it very challenging for us. So what happens if we leave this untreated? Well, these are the things that could happen. You could still have growth failure, even at an adolescence. Um, you can have daytime sleepiness, behavioral learning problems. Their behavior may be more aggressive than what is expected. You might have endocrine abnormalities such as diabetes. But from a pulmonary standpoint, pulmonary hypertension is what we worry about um, as a result of getting systemic hypertension. And so how is this all related? Well, if you have sleep disordered breathing, what ends up happening is that your kidneys start to produce something called renin as well as aldosterone. And so it continues to produce this. And as a result, you get systemic hypertension or high blood pressure. And if this doesn't get treated over time, you start to develop left heart disease. And so this is similar to the elderly um, adult who has high blood pressure for several years and then they eventually are they start having left heart disease which is more like of having heart attacks and plaques in their vessels um, and then eventually the right side of the heart becomes affected and that's what we call as pulmonary hypertension if you have obstructive sleep apnea as well as other changes that happen as a result of not being treated like increased insulin resistance or diabetes, the same thing happens. You have continuous high blood pressure, your left heart is affected, and then eventually the right heart is affected and thus you have pulmonary hypertension. Because the lungs are, are affected here and you're not getting good oxygen levels throughout the body um, from the fact that you have obstructive sleep apnea or central sleep apnea, you can have right ventricular volume overload, meaning that there's more strain on the right side of the heart and as a result of that, you can also have pulmonary hypertension. So there's multiple mechanisms here. Um, and so this is definitely something that we think about when we're looking at the results of a sleep study. Not every patient with, with prader willi syndrome needs to be screened for pulmonary hypertension, but I believe that most patients need to be screened for sleep disordered breathing first. And if it's significant enough, then consider um, a workup for pulmonary hypertension, which usually involves an echocardiogram or an ultrasound of the heart. Okay, so lastly, I want to touch base on generalized treatment modalities. Um, and the first one that most people at this time think about is growth hormone. We know that there are significant beneficial effects in prader willi syndrome patients, including body improving body composition, physical activity, um, and improving their developmental and cognitive milestones. So those are wins for us. Um, for a pulmonary perspective though, there are some studies out there that show that there's improved pulmonary function tests um, after six months of therapy. So that's promising. 
On the downside, we're, I think most people are aware that there are reports of sudden death in patients who've started growth hormone. Um, and it's usually within nine months of starting um, the therapy. And so this is the reason why we like to screen before um, starting growth hormone to identify whether or not you have sleep apnea or not um, so that we can avoid this, um, this outcome. And the reason for why we think that growth hormone contributes to sudden death is that there's this factor called IGF-1. Um, and so this can go increase significantly when you start growth hormone. And as a result of this increase, um, it actually is targets the adenoids and tonsils um, to grow. And so as they grow, it can lead to obstruction while sleeping and thus cause obstructive sleep apnea. We do also have some studies that show an improvement in how Prader Willi kids respond to CO2, as well as improved oxygen saturations during sleep. The mechanism is still not clear. It's not clear as to how long you have to be on growth hormone to get to find these responses. But it's quite interesting that there are some pulmonary benefits from growth hormone, as well as um, some negative outcomes as well. So in general, the, the plan for most of these kids is symptomatic care. So watching the food intake, strict limitation, behavior modification, sometimes pharmacotherapy, maybe surgical bypass. Um, but all of these things have been demonstrated and trialed, but poor results. But those are the things that we have right now. One thing that I want to be weird, uh, to alert you of, though, is adequate airway clearance to improve mobilization of secretions, meaning um, making sure your child has a good cough reflex. And if not, maybe seeing a pulmonary doctor to kind of help you improve their cough um, in different ways uh, so that if they do have a respiratory infection, there's a plan as far as how to reduce um, the risk of developing a pneumonia, as well as reduced to aspiration risk. Lastly, it's screening, identifying, and treating sleep disorder breathing. I think that's very key. The question, though, is when do we do this? There is no consensus as far as when to do that. Do you do it at one year of age? Do you do it at four years of age, like they do in the Down syndrome population? Um, do they do it on a yearly basis? Um, and so we need more studies on this. And so once we have that, then we can come up with a consensus treatment plan um, to figure out when is the best time to screen. Um, and then also, if it is significant enough that the sleep disorder breathing is causing daytime problems and um, significant oxygen saturation problems, then we need to screen for pulmonary hypertension. And again, that's by the uh, ultrasound of the heart or a cardio uh, echocardiogram. So in conclusion, there are several respiratory complications that can be present in the Prader-Willi syndrome population. Most of this is related to their muscle weakness, the obesity, the hypothalamic dysfunction, their spinal abnormalities like scoliosis, and all of these combined can cause poor pulmonary function testing. There are some treatment modalities that are available, but they're not curative. And so it can result in poor adherence because there's a lot of barriers that can prevent good adherence. But I believe screening is key in preventing these complications and just being aware of what's what could happen, um, such as sleep disorder, breathing, and pulmonary hypertension. We do need more studies, and we need to talk more about these things um, so that we can come up with a consensus statement so that we know when to screen appropriately for these conditions in the Prader-Willi syndrome population. So with that, I would like to thank you for your time. Uh, feel free to email me some questions if they come up. Uh, my email is here at the bottom of the slide. Thank you so much for your time. Yes, I want to thank uh, Amy again for everything that she's done. I also want to remind everyone to 
Please send any questions to info at pwsausa.org. Uh, and we will see you again at the next session.